uh, the first to the second quarter. And uh, I'm going to teach a, uh, an introduction to the book of John. So uh, I'm so excited. It's been great uh, studying uh, Deuteronomy and uh, Ephesians in this, in this first quarter. In fact, let's, let's talk about that. The theme for the year, as you all remember, is, uh, is be like-minded. Uh, not, not for everybody, but definitely in, the, in London and maybe in some of the other churches. And uh, the plan that we had was that we would, uh, in, in the first quarter, we focus on being like-minded in our devotion. And uh, the whole idea is that uh, in Deuteronomy and Ephesians, these are both books that talk about uh, how God's household should conduct itself in view of God's grace and God's commands. And Deuteronomy is a book like that, with what, with you know, with that as part of its theme in the Old Testament, and in the New Testament, Ephesians has a very similar kind of a direction to it. And uh, and so, and hence the idea that you know, for us to be like-minded and unified, um, a shared sense of devotion to the one God is so important. And now we're transitioning in in quarter two to talk about the theme or the sub-theme, uh, like-minded in the one gospel. And uh, we're going to look at John because, we, you know, we're not just unified kind of, uh, you know, just any old how, but we're unified in a shared message in that one gospel. And, you know, in fact, where the gospel is, is diluted or where the mission is diverted, um, that's a good reason to actually sometimes not be so unified, you know, uh, that's a good reason for friction, that's a good reason for confrontation, um, but where we are unified in the one gospel, then it is important to, um, uh, you know, to be truly unified, and that message forms the basis for our unity. So, John, we are transitioning to the book of John, John is is that gospel which somehow sounds so different from the other three gospels. The other three gospels, um, as you may know, are called the synoptic gospels. You know, they have a, a similar view and, uh, and, and, and are probably largely based on the book of Mark, which probably was the earliest one written. But the book of John reads very differently. John perhaps was the youngest of the apostles. We don't know for sure. But he did seem to live a lot longer than the other guys. Although, having said that, if the other guys were all martyred, then they didn't have much say on how long they lived. Um, however, John did outlive the others. There's that scene in the upper room where John, you know, everybody was uh, leaning on their left elbow and eating with their right hand. And, uh, you know, so John would have been on Jesus's right and was able to lean back against the chest of Jesus. But some scholars have looked at that and thought, you know, that's kind of a very comfortable thing to do if there's a big age gap. And so maybe, you know, Jesus was 33 and, and John was, you know, 17 or something. And so it's speculation, but perhaps he was quite a bit uh, younger than, than, than some of the others. There's also that scene of how uh, at the resurrection, John ran ahead of Peter to the tomb, you know. And so maybe there's a little bit of this picture of an older man running and uh, huffing and puffing. And then like, like I was doing on Saturday at the men's day, I, I, I did take the challenge to do 20 burpees, but I never knew what a burpee was until Saturday. But oh my goodness, did I discover, uh, and did I discover my unfitness? Oh yes, I did. But, but John ran ahead of Peter. And so again, maybe there's all this little speculations about maybe he was a much younger guy. One thing we do know was that Jesus called him and his brother James sons of thunder because they went to a Samaritan village that wouldn't accept Jesus's teachings. And uh, what did they do? Like Elijah, they wanted to call down fire from heaven. And uh, But that son of thunder, as he became an older man, became known as the apostle of love. He was an elder in Ephesus as an old man. And some of his disciples later on wrote about him that uh, every time you brought a problem to John, John only had one answer. And his answer was, little children love one another. L whatever you told him, hey, bro, we got this problem. Little children love one another. Hey, bro, you know, this person's not behaving properly. Little children love one another. Hey, bro, you know church discipline issue. Little children love one another. And uh, he became known as that apostle of love. 
Um, the dates for the book of John, as well as one, two, three John and the book of Revelation, all of which were written by the same apostle, is, is, is quite late compared to the other uh, 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 books of the New Testament. And depending on how you date it, it is in the 80s or 90s uh, AD. Okay, so um, this is our author, John. The purpose of the book of John is found right towards the end. In John 20, verse 31, John's own stated purposes, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name. And uh, so John was writing in order to produce belief in Jesus as who Jesus said he was, the Messiah, the son of God. And, you know, John's claim uh, and the claim of the apostles was uh, that by, you know, that, that by believing in him, you may have life in his name. And apart from Jesus, no life is possible. There is also the backdrop of uh, some of the early teaching of the Gnostics and others who were mainly known for denying that Jesus had come into the flesh, come in the flesh, which would have been very convenient because when you can spiritize the person of Jesus, um, you know what? There's no cross anymore. There's no suffering anymore. And consequently, it has implications for discipleship because you know, we don't have to be that disciple that carries our cross anymore. And um, so these teachings presented a great threat to the gospel and to what it means to be a follower of Christ. And, uh, uh, you know, with that as a backdrop, also, uh, John is writing his gospels and indeed the letters uh, that he wrote uh, in, in 1 John, 2 John and 3 John as well. Let's talk a little bit about the Bible story. This is important to always understand, to bear in mind, you know, as you read, read the, uh, the, the Bible, the Bible has an arc, uh, sometimes called a meta narrative. And, you know, Romans 10, 17 tells us what you guys know this faith comes from hearing the message, but then it goes on and says, and the message is heard through the word about Christ. Have you ever wondered about that? What does it mean the message is heard through the word about Christ? I believe what it means is that even the Old Testament is properly understood in its relationship to the gospel about Jesus. And you really understand all the teachings of the Bible when you understand how the Old Testament is fulfilled in Christ and the New Testament tells us how to live in Christ. And so the, the meta narrative, the big arc of the Bible is like this. There is creation. God created all things good, especially human beings, his image and, uh, you know, his representatives on earth. But what did humans do? Well, being human, we mucked up. We were proud. We were rebellious. We wanted to throw off the authority of God in our lives. And so our first dad and mom, Adam and Eve, um, in that rebelliousness, in that desire to be the boss of me, OK, that's kind of the human cry. I want to be the boss of me. Um, what they did was they fell. And at, when they fell, sin and death came into the world. And God worked, you know, he he disciplined the earth in the flood. He disciplined the world at Babel. He called one man, Abraham, to himself and through Abraham, the patriarchs and through them, Israel. And he called Israel out of Egypt. And then he gave the law. The law, Paul says, it is good. It is spiritual. But I am unspiritual. You know, humans, humans found out a problem through the law. And that is that because of that base rebelliousness, which is in us all, what happens? The law does nothing more than expose our sin. It has no power to save us. And so what had to happen? Instead of all of us dying for our sin, God became a man in the incarnation so that one man on behalf of all men could perfectly obey that law and offer himself as a sacrifice. And then doing so, he obtained forgiveness of sins for all of us. And, and then he ascended to the heavens, sent the Holy Spirit, and there was the new creation, the recreation. Okay, so that now God through the spirit for those who follow Christ 
can reach into our hearts and perform a little bit of surgery at baptism. And that surgery is sometimes in the New Testament called the circumcision of the heart. And when that, when that heart change is produced, then we become people who slowly, slowly can be led by God to be transformed into the image of Jesus and actually obey that law. Uh, not fully on this earth, but we can grow on this earth. And then in the age to come, we will be liberated from this existence and we will be in new bodies, glorifying God, glory, glory, hallelujah. Now, the, book, the beginning of the book of John has a very deliberate um, um, similarity to the beginning of Genesis, okay? So uh, strikingly, unlike the other gospels, right? The other gospels all begin with genealogies or the story of John the Baptist, you know, or Jesus's birth. And, uh, but John provocatively begins with the words, in the beginning, Okay, and it's meant to shock. It's meant to provoke. It's meant to uh, make us sit up and go, wow, this sounds like the beginning of all creation. Because John is signaling to us a new creation story. And if you ask me, even in those early chapters of John, there's that little, you know, the, the transitions from one event to the other. Uh, John goes, and the next day this happened. And then the next day they were invited to a wedding, you know. And that also has echoes of uh, there was evening and there was morning the first day. And then there was evening and there was morning the second day. And so uh, Jesus' new creation story marches on in the beginning of the book of John in a way that reminds us of the original creation story in Genesis. There are two halves to the book of John. The first half of the book, it's not literally 50% uh, of the chapters, but there's two parts. The first part of the book is called the book of signs. It is in chapters one to 12 and focuses on all of Jesus's ministry until the last week of his life. And that last week of his life, amazingly, is, um, uh, you know, this week right now, we are in the anniversary of that last week of his life because this is what we are in today is the passion week isn't it uh, the week leading up to the crucifixion and resurrection the second part of the book is called the book of glory and that book of glory is all in uh well you know tell you the truth it's kind of the last day of his life uh and then following that the resurrection um uh because john 13 begins in the or well in the in john 13 you go to the upper room all right, in the book of signs, there are seven signs which, uh, which, which, which tell us about who this Messiah is. Um, you know, he, in John 2, he turns water into wine, thus revealing his glory. Uh, the, the water is kept in large stone pots that were used for purification, which uh, itself sent a message to the Jews, okay? The, the purifying water is now being turned into something new, uh, new wine, new creation by John. Um, then he heals the synagogue ruler's child, showing his ability to do that. He heals the crippled man um, at a pool in Jerusalem, which is on the north of the city. I forget the name, Beth, Beth no, it's not Bethesda, but Beth, maybe Bethesda, Bethesda, I can't remember. And then there's the feeding of the 5,000, like a new Moses, he calls down food from heaven and, uh, and feeds the people. Um, then there is the walking on water, which, uh, uh, you know, in the Old Testament, there's an allusion to that, and it's reserved only for God. Um, there's the healing of the blind man, and that happens at the southern pool, the pool of Siloam. Um, and then there is the resurrection of Lazarus. Lazarus. And, um, you know, uh, these signs are messianic signs. They're showing him as the promised one, the Messiah, the son of God, the son of David, who was to come and free Israel. The book of glory is um, uh, the latter part of the book of John. Now, you know, throughout the book of John, there's a phrase that is used, and that is the hour okay so when 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 mary asks john 
to help out at the wedding because she says they have no more wine in a motherly way. She says, she, I, you know, you, you, I guess what that means is um, even before he revealed his glory to the world, she must have known of his power. Okay, somewhere in his house, she came to know. So when they had no more wine, she looked at her son and said, uh, can you do something about this? And he says, you know, woman or dear woman, um, that word woman is, is almost like the word mom or man. Um, it's a respectful term. But anyway, he says to her, you know, why do you, why do you trouble me? My hour has not yet come. And then that word, Jesus' hour had not yet come. Um, it, it's like a drumbeat through the book of John. What does it refer to? It refers to the hour of his glorification. It refers to when he would be lifted up. And that in turn refers to his crucifixion. Okay, so it is a glorification, but it is a glorification in his death on the cross when he is lifted up and rescues all mankind from their sins. You know, in the first 11 chapters of Jesus, the phrase keeps appearing. Jesus' hour had not yet come. They want to stone him, but he escapes because his hour had not yet come, and on and on and on. And then in John chapter 12, when he's at the Passover feast, there are some Greeks, non-Jews, who show up, and they say to Philip, sir, we would see Jesus. And, you know, when Jesus hears that for the first time, instead of saying the hour has not yet come, Jesus says, the hour has come for the son of man to be glorified. And, you know, he says, well, what shall I say? Save me from this hour? No, it was for this hour that I came. Somehow the spreading of the news of the gospel beyond the Jews to these Greeks who had now come inquiring signaled to him that the hour had come. And even putting that on the record in John must have been quite a rebuke to his Jewish readers. So, you know, at that point, uh, John has test, I mean, Jesus has testified to the crowds. He's testified to the Jewish leadership. And in John 12, 36, we read, when he had finished, Jesus left and hid himself from them. Because at this point, his public ministry had ended. From that point onwards, He's simply teaching his disciples or he's talking to people during his trial and after his resurrection. From John 13 to John 17, Jesus is with his disciples in the upper room in Bethany. And then he's also on a walk to Gethsemane uh, as part of that time, uh, which is west of Bethany on the other side of the Mount of Olives. There in John 18, he is betrayed and he is arrested. He is crucified in John 19. In John 20, we read the resurrection account. And in John 21, in Galilee, we read about how he, uh, you know, encourages Peter. And uh, I guess in our, in our Bibles, we see the little uh, subtitle, Jesus reinstates Peter. One other important part in the book of John is in John chapter 14 to 17. This section of scripture is called by scholars, the farewell discourse. And why is it called the farewell discourse? Because it has echoes of um, long teaching passages in the Old Testament, as well as um, teaching passages of Jewish teachers in the intertestamental period. That is in the 400 years before Christ, in the 400 years since Malachi was written. And these Jewish leaders, whether Moses or Joshua or Samuel, or whether these um, uh, 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 extra biblical, these Jewish leaders who are you know, not in the Bible, um, they have uh, a custom. And that is that they give a long teaching section as part of their last words. And so Jesus does something very, very similar in John chapters 14 to 17. These farewell discourses had um, certain characteristics that they all shared. So, you know, um, um, one of those was there would be a plea for obedience to the law. So, for example, uh, you know, towards the end of Deuteronomy or Samuel, when he's saying goodbye to the people, 
or Joshua towards the end of Joshua or David when he's speaking to Solomon, you know, there's a, there's a plea for the people to not turn to the left, to not turn to the right, but to obey the law of God. Then a second characteristic of a farewell discourse is that writings are left behind. So Moses left behind the Pentateuch, Samuel left behind one Samuel, and maybe some of two Samuel, but a lot of two Samuel was after Moses died. I mean, Samuel died, so it couldn't have been him who wrote it. Uh, Joshua, you know, he left behind the accounts of, uh, of, of what happened under his leadership. Uh, David left behind the Psalms and various books of, of, of uh, where his reign was chronicled. Um, uh, then another, another characteristic of, the farewell, of a farewell discourse is that the leader would leave behind a spirit-filled successor. Moses left behind Joshua. David, I mean, Samuel left behind Saul. Elijah left behind Elisha. Um, David left behind Solomon. And then a final characteristic of a farewell discourse is that there would be some comfort offered, offered for those who remained because obviously people, the people would grieve that a great prophet was going, that Moses was going or, or David was going. And so comfort would be offered. And so in this farewell discourse also, we see Jesus employ these characteristics, but even take it higher because this is something new that is happening. So, you know, Jesus calls for them and for us to remain in the word. Okay, he, he, he says, remain in me and I in you. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, you know, then you ask for whatever you wish and it'll be done for you. And, uh, you know, he calls for, for them, he calls for us to remain in his word, not just the law, uh, but his word, because he is the fulfillment of the law. And indeed to remain in him because he is the word become flesh. Um, Jesus, like those other writers, uh, and, and leaders, he leaves his teaching behind. And who is the teaching entrusted to? It is entrusted to the apostles. And he tells the apostles, the spirit himself will remind you of all that I have said, okay? And so uh, he entrusts um, the, 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 you know, the New Testament writing uh, to them. Um, you know, rather than just appoint a successor who is filled with the spirit, in this case, Jesus being the son of God and no ordinary prophet, his successor is the very Holy Spirit himself. He says, you know, it's good for you that I'm going. You're grieving, he says, you know, but it's good because when I go, I will ask the father and he will send another, another comforter, another counselor, another advocate, another defender. And, uh, and that will be the Holy Spirit himself. And then finally, the, the comfort that, that he offers is an ultimate comfort. And again, it is different from the past, okay? It's not just, listen, you know, be strong and courageous. God will be with you. Um, in fact, what Jesus says is actually, I will not leave you as orphans. He says, you know, it's not that I'm actually leaving you. It's only my body, which is leaving right now. But actually through the Holy Spirit, the Father and I will come and make our home with you um, and, and with all who follow, um, who become followers of the Son. And so uh, this is also an important feature of the book of John that we should note and grab a hold of and understand. So who is Jesus? John is trying to answer that question. He has the seven signs uh, of, of who Jesus is in, in, in the book of signs, in the first um, part of the book of John. But then along with the signs, there are claims about Jesus that are made by Jesus himself in the gospel of John. These claims are black and white claims. They force us to make a decision one way or the other. You know, they cannot be treated as symbolic. They cannot be treated as metaphors. You know, they are the type of claims where we have to say, you know, Either they are true or they are false. And therefore, Jesus is either who he says he is, or he is a liar, or he is a lunatic, or he is a legend, or else the apostles just fabricated the whole thing because these are black and white signs. 
these signs are all made using the words I am. And, you know, that I am is very significant to the Jews because when God identified himself to Moses, he said, he used the words Yahweh, which, you know, in, in Greek, I get, I mean, in Hebrew, I guess they didn't have vowels. And um, that's why sometimes in our Bibles in English, we find capitalized Y-H-W-H, -H, or you might also find a capitalized L-O-R-D across your Old Testament, wherever the word Yahweh uh, appears, okay, the, the four uh, Hebrew alphabets that tell us that it is Yahweh means I am. And then in Greek, I believe it is something like ego I me. Don't know how you pronounce it. Um, but that Greek rendition, ego I me, refers to the Hebrew Yahweh, which is the very name of God. I am. I am that I am. Okay. It's, it's, it's a, even the expression is very, it's kind of self explanatory, isn't it? It kind of talks about how God is just, just he just always is. There's no beginning, there's no end. He's ever present, he's all knowing, he's all powerful. He just is. The rest of us have a start, we have an end, but he just is. And provocatively, Jesus used those that phrase, I am, to refer to himself. And that's why the Jews accused him of blasphemy, which they wanted to kill him for. For example, in John 5, 18. So the Jews understood very well what his claim was. And that's why, for example, in John 5, 18, they say for this very, it, the, uh, John says, for this very reason, they tried all the more to kill him. Not only was he breaking the Sabbath, but he was even calling God his own father, making himself equal to God. They understood what he was saying, and they were not happy. What are the I am claims? The I am claims that he makes uh, includes these ones. I am the bread of life, he says. You know, Moses gave you the bread, but I am the bread. And, you know, I mean, Jesus rammed home this point to the nth degree, to the point where they were so uncomfortable. And even his disciples were uncomfortable. He says, man, you've got to eat the flesh and drink the blood of the Son of, of, the Son of God. And he did go on to explain, listen, the flesh counts for nothing. It's the spirit who gives life. And he, so he was clearly telling them, you must have a dependence on me um, that is total. And uh, apart from me, you can do nothing, he told his disciples in John 15. He said, I am the light of the world. I am the light, not a light. I am the light of the world, okay? Just as light belongs to God, um, I am the light of the world. I am the good shepherd, he said. Um, again, a designation that in the Old Testament was reserved for God shepherding his people, you know, um, uh, that the passage where he talks about this is in John 10, which is supposed to make us remember Ezekiel 34, where God says he's going to shepherd the people and he rebukes the bad shepherds of Israel. And now Jesus is saying, I am the good shepherd, just like God is the shepherd that gets rid of the bad shepherds. He says, but not only is he the shepherd, he says, I'm also the gate. I'm not just the shepherd of the sheep. I'm actually the door through which they come in and go out and find safe pasture. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. And again, you know, he in a conversation with Martha, he tells her, she says, yeah, I know at the end of the time, you know, when the Messiah comes, then people will rise from the dead. And he says, no, 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 no. I am here right now. I am the resurrection and the life. And then he goes on and raises her brother Lazarus from the dead. And then, you know, kind of all on its own, he tells the Jews, before Abraham was born, I am. And, and they picked up stones to throw him, to throw at him, because um, he was saying that he, this man who was in his 30s, he was saying he pre-existed even Abraham. And then, in, in, you know, to his disciples, he says, I am the way and the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. A unique claim. You know, it, it, it's like the claim of being the gate. You only come to God through me. Another theme, a motif in the book of John is light and darkness. Light and darkness um, and day and night appear regularly in, in the book of John. 
Acknowledging Jesus means you are in the light. Denying Jesus means you are in the darkness. Um, uh, you know, if you uh, if you see, uh, if you if you have light and if you can see spiritually, it does not depend on how intelligent you are. It does not depend on whether you understand the scriptures in your head, but rather it depends on how humble you are to acknowledge that Jesus is who he says he is and to lay down your life in obedience to him. Um, wisdom, therefore, you know, you could be a very simple person like the woman at the well or a person who was never educated like the blind man who he healed. But you could be very wise and seeing because you had a heart of a disciple. You were willing to submit and obey and believe. Wisdom, therefore, belongs not to the intelligent, but to the obedient. There were those who knew the scriptures backwards, but they failed to recognize Jesus as the fulfillment of those scriptures. In John 3, verses 20 to 21, Jesus makes this clear. He says, everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that their deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light so that it may be seen plainly that what they have done has been done in the sight of God. You know, for me, this this the starkest memory I have as a young man of where this became so clear to me was when myself and one of the other brothers was studying the Bible with a guy in Imperial College. And this guy was super open. Um, we were studying, we had gotten up to sin and repentance, and he was you know, totally embracing of God's word. He wanted to become a Christian. He confessed his sins. He was getting ready to repent. And then we came for the next study and he had completely changed. And it was so weird. It wasn't just that he was resisting repentance. He was even questioning fundamental doctrines about, uh, you know, the, I can't even remember the Bible being the word of God and, 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 you know, who Jesus is. And I can't even remember, but I was, but I was so dumbstruck by the change because these issues had never been issues. And that was the first time I was a very young leader. And I remember just praying while he was talking. And I remember thinking, okay, wait a minute, maybe this has nothing to do with the doctrine. And I remember looking at him and I remember asking him, has your girlfriend showed up again? And he looked at me shamefacedly and he said, yes. And I said, did you guys get back together again? And he said, yes. And I said, well, then don't talk about doctrine. The, your, you know, your whole change of tone is because you don't want to accept this now. It's too inconvenient for you because you've gone back to your girlfriend. And he said, yes. And that's what Jesus is making clear in this passage is that when people, now, obviously a newcomer that has some doctrinal questions or intellectual questions, we need to provide some answers, you know? But as the studies go on, you can be sure of one thing. When somebody suddenly comes up with some new doctrinal objection, the issue is not intellectual. The issue is moral. The issue is spiritual. The issue is because they don't want to. And at the end of the day, people's belief or disbelief in, in, in Jesus and in the Bible comes, it, you know, we are, not, uh, we are not as objective as we think we are, okay? All human beings are a package of intellectual and moral and, you know, we have wills and we have emotions and we have thoughts. And what happens is because at the end of the day, obedience is too difficult, the vast majority of people end up rejecting Jesus and sadly dying in the darkness. And let that be a source of great conviction to us so that even as lockdown restrictions open up, let's, let's recapture the zeal that we know we should have for seeking and saving the lost. Are you with me there? You can say amen quietly. All right, so there's, there's another underlying um, um, question that is being asked through the book of John. And that is, 
Who is a true disciple? Who is a true disciple? In John 8, 31, Jesus says, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. He was speaking to Jews who believed him. But, you know, he knew their hearts and he was willing to test their hearts. And he said, listen, it's not about just belief. If you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. Uh, not too long after that, I believe in John chapter 12, we're told that many among the leaders believed him, but they were not willing to acknowledge it because the chief priests and others had said, if you follow this man, you'll be put out of the synagogue. No, if you hold to my teaching, you are really my disciples. In John 13, 35, he says, by this all men will know that you are really my disciples if you have love one for another. And he defined that love as being, you know, as I have loved you, so you must love one another. You know, this is the love that washes feet. This is the love that speaks the truth in love. This is the love that lays down its life for its brothers. In John 15, verse 8, he says, this is to my father's glory that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be what? Showing yourselves to be my disciples. Fruit bearing is another mark of a disciple. That disciple who remains in Christ and Christ remains in him. That disciple, like a branch attached to a vine, bears an abundance of good fruits. In the Bible, um, the good fruit is the product of our walk with God. Um, it is the impact of our walk with God. Yes, it is the overflow of the spirit into a Christ-like character in our lives. And yes, it is that overflow which has an impact in the lives of other people and that brings along more souls, that um, strengthens the church, that helps other people so that they glorify God. In John 15 and verse 20, he says, remember what I told you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they obey my teaching, they will obey yours also. And so as his servants, as his students, as his disciples, another mark of a disciple is that they are willing to suffer along with him. The book of Philippians tells us it has been granted to you not only to believe in Christ, but also to suffer for him. Paul writing to Timothy says, everyone who wants to lead a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted while imposters and wicked men go from bad to worse. So these are the marks of a true disciple. Um, in John 1 and verses 11 and 12, uh, John, in the right at the beginning, in the prologue, John says he came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. And then as you leave that prologue and you go into John 1 and John 2, and then, um, you know, you move on through, especially the first half of the book of John, Jesus keeps encountering people. And every time there's kind of a hidden question, and that is, is this person a real follower? Is this person a real disciple? And what we learn is there are certain qualities that the true disciples have. So one of those is they have a real encounter with Jesus. Um, so, you know, there, there's, there's, some, there's some conversation where, uh, which goes to the heart, okay, as they meet Jesus. And but but they come out of that encounter correctly identifying him as the Messiah. And then when once they've done that, they have a testimony. They're able to go and talk to others about their belief. And then what we see is they remain in him in spite of testing, in spite of challenge, in spite of suffering. So, for example. Uh, after the prologue in the beginning of John, Andrew meets Jesus. And what does he do? He goes off and he brings his brother Peter. There's an encounter. There's a witness. There's a testimony. Philip meets Jesus. And what does he do? He goes off and brings Nathaniel. There's an encounter. And there's a witness. 
the Samaritan woman meets Jesus. And man, he slices and dices as he talks to her about her sins. But she sees him. She understands who he is. You know, she, he, she, she, she says, hey, when Messiah comes, he'll explain it to us. Everything. All these things you're talking about. And Jesus says, well, I am he. And so, you know, what does she do? She goes off and brings her whole village. The blind man in Acts 9, he meets Jesus. And what does he do? He, you know, his parents are all squeamish. The neighbors are all cynical. The Pharisees are just bad hearted, you know. And but what does he do? He witnesses. He testifies. He suffers along with Jesus. He's not ashamed of his Messiah. And then in contrast, you know, you have wise men like Nicodemus who they show up at night and we're not sure, you know. He does seem to improve. And later on, you know, he stands up for Jesus in the Sanhedrin and he comes with Joseph of Arimathea to, to, to you know, to, um, uh, to um, prepare Jesus's body for burial, you know. And, uh, and but we, we wonder about him. He, you know, he, we wonder if he's for real because he's saying some things. He's not getting it with the same clarity as, as, as the Samaritan woman, for example, who appears in the next chapter. Um, the crippled man in John chapter five, he's healed by Jesus, but you know, we're never really completely sure about him. Is he, is he ratting Jesus out to the authorities or, or what's he doing exactly? You know, there's not a clarity. Um, Judas walks with Jesus for three years, but he doesn't remain in Jesus. And in John 12, 42 and 43, we read yet at the same time, many, even among the leaders believed in him, but because of the Pharisees, they would not openly acknowledge their faith. For fear, they would be put out of the synagogue, for they loved human praise more than praise for God. And so, who is a true disciple? Listen, you and I have a long way to go, brothers and sisters. There are, there are people who, you know, they advanced in years, and then they left the Lord. And so, you know, the exhortation is for us as well. Um, uh, you, we must not grow lukewarm. We must not let our hearts get weighed down with dissipation and drunkenness and the cares of this world. We must not allow our love to grow cold. We must not become professional ministers who lose their first love. We must not allow these things to happen to us, but rather, you know, we, we must every day relish our Bible study and our prayer. We must quickly confess our temptations. We need to make sure we're in the fight and in evangelism. You know, uh, we need to re rejoice in Lord. We need to love the songs the way we love the songs in the beginning. And we need to be thankful. You know, uh, you know uh, there's an amazing verse at the beginning of Romans 1, which talks about the decline of man. And it, it says, you know, you know, people knew God, but they didn't acknowledge him as God and they were not thankful. And then they slid downwards into idolatry and into gross spiraling sin. And you know what I get out of that? If you lose your thankfulness, it's like the beginning of the end. It's like the, it's like, it's maybe that is what it means to lose your first love. And, um, you know, let's not be those, but rather let's be those who go from strength to strength, adding to faith, goodness and to goodness, knowledge and to knowledge, self-control and to self-control, godliness and to godliness, perseverance and to perseverance, brotherly kindness and to brotherly kindness, love. Let's be those people who possess these qualities in increasing measure. OK, I think that may be the very end of my lesson. Come on, baby. So uh, thanks so much for your attention. Um, that was awesome. And uh, let's go ahead.